Great. Our next speaker is Laura Finger. Her um, title is Using Diffusion Tensor Imaging to Find Optimal Deep Brain Stimulation Target for the Treatment of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Laura's um, abstract has been accepted at AAA for a poster presentation. Here's Laura. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, my contact information is at the top of this slide here if you have any questions or would like to reach me. And my project's very complicated, but I'll try my best to break it down for you. So, oops, sorry. Okay, just to provide some background and rationale to my project. Obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, is characterized by obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are recurrent and persistent thoughts or urges, and those are followed by compulsions, which are repetitive behaviors or mental rituals. Neuroimaging studies have shown that patients with OCD have a hyperconnectivity between the orbitofrontal cortex, which is an area in the prefrontal cortex here, and the striatum. The severity of OCD is measured using the Yale-Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale, or YBOX for short, and OCD is usually treated with cognitive behavioral therapy and pharmacotherapy. However, about 35% of patients fail to respond to treatment at all and are deemed treatment resistant or treatment refractory and about 10% remain severely ill and are candidates for neurosurgical intervention. Deep brain stimulation, or DBS, involves a neurosurgical implantation of electrodes in the brain. They're connected to an extension wire, which is then connected to a stimulator implanted in the chest here. DBS delivers high-frequency stimulation to specific areas in the brain, but the mechanism is not fully understood. And DBS is an alternative to ablation, so ablation is permanently destroying brain tissue with a laser, but unlike ablation, DBS is largely reversible because it can be turned off, it's titratable, more precise, and destroys less brain tissue overall. And past studies have shown that DBS reduces the hyperconnectivity in patients with treatment-resistant OCD. However, due to the small number of patients with treatment-resistant OCD being treated with DBS, about 150 patients worldwide, there's little consensus on the best target for stimulation. Multiple brain targets have been investigated, including the anterior limb of the internal capsule, nucleus accumbens, and the ventral capsule or ventral striatum, which are all in similar anatomical location seen here in this figure. So to attempt to fill that gap, I use diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI, as a way to visualize white matter tracks in the brain. The tracks connect cortical and nuclear areas, and we can use it to see um, what areas in the brain are being stimulated with DBS. So that brings us to my objective and hypothesis. The purpose of the study is to use DTI to determine the optimal target for DBS in patients with treatment-resistant OCD, and we hypothesize that DBS will target unique fiber tracts in each patient, and that those different tract profiles will correlate with each patient's clinical response as measured by that Y box. So my project has two main components, the first being clinical assessments or those diagnostic rating scales, and then the second being the imaging with the CT, MRI, and DTI. So with the clinical assessments, we can look at the Y-box scores before DBS surgery and after surgery, and then with imaging, we can recon re reconstruct the 3DS, 3, 3D DBS electrodes, get a volume of tissue activated, and see white matter tracks going through that area. Then we try to put the two together and see if there's a correlation between the two. So the first component is the clinical assessments. Diagnostic rating scales are administered to patients, and the main scale that we focused on was the Y-box score, which measures the OCD symptom severity, and it ranges from 0 to 40. That can be further broken down into these different categories here. And I look at these scores before DBS surgery to get a baseline. And all of our patients are within this extreme category. And because they are treatment resistant or treatment refractory, they don't really move out of this category and no treatment helps them. Then I look at those scores after surgery at these four different time points here. So what I've found from this, here we have our Y-box score of every patient. We had five patients in total and the percent difference from pre-surgery baseline, so before DBS surgery. And this black bar here represents baseline. So anything above it would be a percent increase in OCD versus 
50% decrease in OCD. So we can see that on average, our patients have had a 44% decrease in their OCD symptom severity, which is huge because these are patients that didn't react to any treatment before surgery. And according to literature, anything that's 35% or greater is considered an effective treatment. And here we have graphed our five patients, and then along the y-axis, the days needed for optimal benefit. So some patients obtained benefit in less than 100 days, while some patients took a lot longer to get benefit. Um, so again, that's showing that it varies per patient, and it could be very different from one person to the next. And finally, on this graph, we have it broken down into each patient again, and then our days post-stimulation, so since first turning on DBS, and then percent change from our baseline. So that black bar represents baseline again, and then anything away from it is a percent change. And you can see that every patient has had a percent decrease in OCD symptom severity, which is again huge because these are patients that didn't respond to treatment before. So then the second part of my project is the imaging. And I can use a specific program to find the 3D electrodes, um, find the electrodes within that patient's imaging. And I can reconstruct it within this 3D MNI brain space. And then plug in specific settings for each patient at each time and create this volume of tissue activated, or VTA, which is this little bubble here. From that, I can segment out that bubble and then plug it into another program and then I can visualize white matter tracks specifically going through that area. And that mimics what would be the tracks that are stimulated during um, stimulation. So from that, we have graphed here our voltage and our VTA area, so that little bubble of stimulation. And we can see that as voltage is increasing, so is the VTA area, which makes sense. And then we can see All right. You can see here, um, we have our FA mean and our MD mean, which are both just coefficients of DTI. Um, and we graph that with our VTA area. So there kind of isn't a correlation between all of the patients as a general population. They are within a similar range, but each patient has a different coefficient value. We're just simulating like we're hitting different tracks in each patient. So then we try to put the two together to see if there is a correlation with their diagnostic rating scales or that Y-box score with their DTI score at the bottom here. And again, there isn't really a correlation between all of the population, but each patient varies in terms of which DTI coefficient value they have. So that's again saying we're hitting specific tracks. So in conclusion, changes in DTI coefficients suggest that modification and stimulation parameters that led to that clinical benefit or that decreasing Y-box score was associated with activation of distinct fiber populations and thus different neural pathways. Thus, our hypothesis is accepted in saying that DBS targets unique fiber tracks in each patient and that those different track profiles will be indicative of each patient's clinical response. So essentially, this leads to personalized medicine and personalized care for each patient. So there's no one specific optimal or right target that applies to every patient within this group. And then I'd just like to thank everyone on this slide. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, if you have any questions for Laura at this time, please submit them to the chat box. Uh, we do have a few moments here for um, questions. So I have a question. Um, Based on your findings, how do you think treatment for this uh, treatment-resistant OCD population should move forward since you said it's focused on personalized medicine now? Yeah, um, so I think what we're doing right now is effective. So we use a larger electrode um, in OCD patients than we would for um, patients that are getting GPS and other treatments. And um, they can use the different contacts along that electrode. So I think just like trial and error with each patient is needed to see which gets the best clinical benefit. Um, but the implantation is stopped uh, within a similar anatomical area. So it's not like completely different part of the brain. But doing what we're doing works, but I think it'll take a while to figure out what works best for each patient. Sounds good. 
Um, let's see. Looks like don't have any further questions in the chat box and we're pretty close on time. So we'll go ahead and move on. Thank you so much, Laura, for your presentation.